After our Bible study last week, well, we took a look at the dead church that was in Sardis. We, in our study this week, we're going to take a look at the church that was in Philadelphia, a church that was the total opposite of the church that was in Sardis. We will remember that the church in Sardis, it was dead because it was dead in its works. It was dead in its faith. It was not abiding by the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, because the church in Sardis was not living by the Holy Spirit, not being led by the Holy Spirit, the church in Sardis was not able to bear any fruit that was holy and righteous. What we'll see here in our study this week is a church that was faithful. And because it abided by the Spirit, because it was led by the Spirit, we'll see that this church, that it overcame, that this church was able to bear fruit that was holy and righteous. So our study this week, it takes place once again there in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. And this week we're going to work our way from the seventh verse down through the 13th verse. And our key verses for our study this week is going to be the seventh and the eighth verse. And again, we are taking a look at the faithful church with a subtopic that will take a look at the reward of faith. There is a reward for you sincerely believing in, for you sincerely being obedient to the word of God, which again, we will see here in our study this week. So our study, it opens up there in the seventh verse there of the third chapter of the book of Revelation with scripture stating, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. That's quite some greeting that again, this is Jesus that he has for the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Once again, we see where this message is being addressed to another church to the angel of the church, which by this point in time, we know that the angel of the church is representative of the messenger of the church, likely again, the pastor. Let's take a look at this greeting though. This is some greeting that, that Jesus has for the church in Philadelphia. Again, he says, these things says he who is holy, he who is true. Okay. And then he said, he who has the key of David. He is describing himself here, right? Jesus, again, the only begotten son of God. We know that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. We know this because, again, not only is he the only begotten son of God, but he comes through the seed of David, as, as Isaiah, the book of Isaiah prophesied, along with other prophecies of the Old Testament as well. He has the key of David. That's what Jesus said there. And again, him addressing himself, saying that he who is holy, he who is true, and again, saying he who has the key of David, it speaks of his authority. It speaks of his sovereignty as well. Him having the key of David, Jesus, he says in the 16th chapter of Matthew's gospel and the 19th verse that, that with the key that he has, he has authority over heaven. And he said that with that key, that he's going to share that key with all of those that sincerely believe, all of those that sincerely trust are obedient in, in following his instructions. Again, we know that we are supposed to be obedient in loving the Lord with our whole heart, right? And we know that we are also supposed to be obedient in, in that love, by loving all of those that are around us as well, loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. You and I, because we have that key, I hope you understand that, that we too have the key to the heavenly kingdom. We have a key to the kingdom of heaven. And so with that key, I want you to understand that, that you and I, we carry a great responsibility. That's not something that I think that we as the children of the Lord understand today is that, that we carry a great responsibility with that key. What do you do with that key? Do you carelessly walk around with that key? Or do you carry that key with a great responsibility? Jesus, he actually wants you to do something with that key. With that key, you and I, we are supposed to minister of the kingdom of heaven. We are supposed to share the kingdom of heaven with all of those that are around us. And the kingdom of heaven, it is open to everyone. 
And you and I, because we walk by faith, we are led by the Holy Spirit because we have received the divine truth. We know the divine truth. We are to minister that divine truth with all of those that are around us. Again, let us remember the first works. Our work is again to believe in the one whom the Father has sent. In that faith, in our faith in Christ, Christ, he gave us a commission. And in that commission, Christ, he tasked us to go out into all nations of people, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the sound doctrine. It is supposed to be taught to all people. All the ways that Christ commanded us to go in, we are to minister that to all of those that are around us. Again, we carry around a very great responsibility that I think that many of us as believers, we, we take it lightly. We take it for granted. We, we aren't doing what we are supposed to be doing. And again, when we think about the five churches that we have looked at prior to this study, we saw that that was becoming a major issue for the church that was in Pergamos, that was beginning to compromise itself. We saw that that was a major issue for the church in Thyatira that was corrupted. And again, in our study last week, the church inside this, it was dead in works. It was a dead church. But the church in Philadelphia, again, was quite different. OK, and we'll see that here in a moment. Again, I just want to touch on that, that seven verse again, uh, a key scripture of my study here today, where again, we'll see that Jesus speaking from from a place of sovereign authority, as we have seen with with all of the churches that we have studied so far. He said, he who is holy says these things says he who is holy, he who is true. How can that not remind you of, of what Jesus said in the 14th chapter of John's gospel, what is recorded in the sixth verse of that chapter, where Jesus, in response to a question that had been asked to him about where it was that he was going, Jesus said about himself that he is the way, that he is the truth and the life. Jesus said that no man could go to the father, but by him. Jesus, he is the way to the kingdom of heaven. Again, he has the key and he has shared the key with all of us. The key being the word of God. Jesus said that he is the way. He is the truth. As we said in our study last week, that Jesus is the light of the world. He is the bringer. He was the revealer of the divine truth that all of us receive, that all of us live by. So again, Jesus, we should understand there in the seventh verse, in his greeting to the church in Philadelphia, he is saying he is speaking, I should say, from a place of sovereign authority. Again, he is holy. All right. He, he has no sin within him, right? He is holy. He is righteous. He who is true. That is Jesus. Nobody else. That is Jesus. Now, what is this message that Jesus has for the church in Philadelphia? Now, I do want to point out right away, I, I should have did this at the start, that, that this Philadelphia, this city should not be confused with the city in America. OK, this is a totally different Philadelphia, but it is also known as the city of brotherly love. So what's the message that Jesus has for for this church that was in Philadelphia? Let's let's again take a look there at the eighth verse. There's something else that I'm going to touch on in the seventh verse, but it's also mentioned here in the eighth verse where Jesus, he says there in the eighth verse, Jesus says, I know your works. He commands this church, right? And then Jesus said there, see, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. So what was it that Jesus had commanded about this church? Well, he commanded this church for his works. And what you'll notice there is that their works were faithful. Again, very close attention there to that eight verse where, where Jesus, he said that, again, I know your works. He said, see, I have set you an open door and no one can shut it for you have a little strength. Right. This is touching on their faith. They have a little strength. And then he said there, even more importantly, he said, you have kept my word. What does that mean? Well, they were living in obedience to his word. They had kept his word. In other words, 
in their living in obedience to the word of God, they were being faithful. They had a little strength. And again, pay close attention to how that verse ends, where Jesus said that those who are of this church, they had not, they did not deny his name. Again, this, it speaks of their faith, which again is, is very significant. This commendation that Jesus has for the church in Philadelphia is very significant. Again, when we consider what those churches in that region was going through. And we, we had a church in Sardis that Jesus really couldn't commend anything about that church. If you remember our study last week, Jesus, he did not speak highly of their works. Their works were not perfect. Their works were, were incomplete. Now, the other churches that we have seen so far, for example, the one in Pergamos, the one in Thyatira, again, Jesus, he could, could commend them of their works. They, they were actually moving in faith, but they were allowing their faith to either be compromised or, or they're allowing their faith to be corrupted. The church in Philadelphia, they were overcoming. They had a little strength. They were able to, to stand up to those who may have tried to compromise them in their faith. They were able to stand up to those that may have come in with a false doctrine that may have tried to preach a false doctrine to, to those that were around them. They were like those who are of the church of Ephesus, except they actually probably went about it better to where they did not move out of bitterness. They were obedient to the word of God. And as we have already said, remembering the first works that we are supposed to believe in the Lord and in believing in the Lord, we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. I believe that those who are of the church in Philadelphia, that they move out of love. They, they yes, rebuke those that may have come in with a false doctrine, but they didn't do it out of bitterness. They actually rebuked in a manner to where they offered correction, where they showed those who may have come in with a false doctrine. They may have shown them, and I do believe that they showed them the proper way in which they were to go. They live by the word of God. Again, this church, the church in Philadelphia is a great deal like the church that was in Smyrna. Though both those churches, the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia, they were commanded by the Lord and there was no rebuke. God didn't get on the, ch the church in Smyrna. You will recall the church in Smyrna, the persecuted church. The only thing that the Lord said to them, keep doing what you're doing. Keep, keep enduring as you are doing and you will persevere. And here you don't see a rebuke. We won't see a rebuke at all here from the Lord to those who were of the church in Philadelphia. Now, Something that I do want to touch on here, and like I said there, it's also referenced in the seventh verse. If we take a look at the seventh verse, again, where Jesus said that he was the one who had the key of David, you will see there that Jesus said that he is the one who opens and no one can shut it. Again, he, he has that power. Nobody is going to close a door on Jesus, right? He said, he who opens and no one shuts. And he said that he also shuts and no one is able to open. What do you think that he was talking about there? What do you think that Jesus is able to open that nobody else can open? And I already gave you the answer to that, where Jesus said that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life. He said that no one can come to the father, but by him. What do you think the father is? Well, we know where the father is. The father is in his heavenly kingdom and Jesus sits at his right hand. Jesus said, can't nobody get to the father, but by him. So when we take a look here at the eighth verse where Jesus said that he knew their works, you'll see that, that he said for those who are of the church in Philadelphia, you'll see that he said that he had set before them an open door. He said that no one can shut it. No one is able to shut that door. The door is open. So the question that we must ask now is, well, what is this an open door to? And I think that many of us right away, we would consider, well, it must be an open door to the kingdom of heaven. And I would certainly agree with all of you and I will agree with all of you, but there are three possibilities. Okay. There are two more possibilities. I should say that go along with that. The obvious, I believe possibility there. So let's take a moment here to turn over to the 
14th chapter of the book of Acts. And when you get to the 14th chapter of the book of Acts, I want you to take a look at the 27th verse there, because there are, again, three possibilities that the open door can be a reference to. So in the 14th chapter and the 27th verse, you'll see there where Paul said, now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Now, in that verse, we'll see where Paul was speaking about his ministry, how he had went out to the Gentiles and he was speaking about how he had did exactly what we have been called to do to where, again, we are to minister the word of God to all people. No matter who they are, we are supposed to minister the word of God. Paul said that he had done that. And in doing that, again, he said that in the 27th verse, he said that God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So the door that the Lord had set before those who are of the church in Philadelphia could be a door that was open to faith. It could be a door that in that faith was open to gaining more wisdom, gaining more knowledge, gaining more, more understanding. Something that you will always hear me speak about is the significance and the importance for Bible study. And even for Sunday school as well, there are many believers who don't think that they need Sunday school. But if you listen to me teach Sunday school, I promise you, you certainly need to be in Sunday school. I, I have always loved Sunday school. And I think, again, all of us, we, we need anything that will help us increase our understanding of the word of God. And that's certainly Sunday school. And that is Bible study. Your faith, as I said in last week's study. Your faith should not be stagnant. You see, stagnant faith that sits still, that's dead faith. Faith is always supposed to be moving. We have the Holy Spirit abiding in us, as I said in last week's study. We have the Holy Spirit abiding in us. The Holy Spirit is always on the go. The Holy Spirit is always craving. It is always desiring what is holy and what is righteous. You yourself as a child of God, you, because the Holy Spirit abides in you, you should crave what is holy and righteous. You should desire what is holy and righteous. In that desire, you and I, we should always seek to be growing. We should always seek to be maturing in our faith, in our wisdom, our knowledge, and in our understanding of the word of God. Why is that? Because in growing and in maturing in our understanding of the word of God, we benefit ourselves. We are able to strengthen ourselves in, in this life that we live, on this journey, in this walk of faith that, that we are on. Not only is that a benefit for us, but again, it's a benefit for all of those that are around us. Again, we have a job to do. We have been commissioned with a task directly from Christ to where we are to minister the word of God. We are to help all of those that are around us, not just in physical matters, but in spiritual matters as well. And that is something that that we as believers, we often overlook. We often miss. We are to minister the word of God. We are to testify of the Lord. We are to share our testimony of what the Lord has done for us. I believe that that door had been set for those who are in the church in Philadelphia as well. And I believe that that they did exactly that that they ministered the word of God, that they testified of the Lord, that they shared their testimony as well. So that's one possibility for what that door could be a reference to. There is another possibility that that door can be a reference to as well that is spoken of in, in Paul's letters to those who are in Corinthian or in Corinth. You can see it in 1 Corinthians. Uh, you can see it in 2 Corinthians as well. I want to turn over here. To 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter and the ninth verse. And I want to read that scripture out to you so that you can see the door that Paul was speaking about to those who are in uh, to those who are in Corinth, where he said there in the eighth verse, he said, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. And then in the ninth verse, the one that I want to focus on there, he said, for a great and effective door has opened to me. 
this, again, not a door that was opened, that he opened on his own or that somebody else had opened to him. It was a door that had been opened to him by the Lord. He said that there was an effective door that had been opened to him and there are many adversaries. He was tearing in Ephesus because he had an opportunity to do good. Okay, He had an opportunity to, again, minister the word of God. In 2 Corinthians, when we turn over to 2 Corinthians and we take a look at the second chapter there and the 12th verse, again, we'll see Paul, he wrote and he said, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and again, he said, a door was opened to me by the Lord. All right. And you can go ahead and if you want to, you can finish reading the rest of that passage of scripture there. But I wanted to take that verse specifically because Paul was looking at the open door as, again, a pathway of opportunities. So a door can open to you to be a pathway to you, have an opportunity to receive a blessing, right? There, there are always doors opening that can be a door that you should walk through if you desire to take possession of a blessing that the Lord has for you. At the same time, the Lord will open doors for you to be the blessing to someone else. Did you hear what I said there? I hope you understood exactly what I said there. Yes, there are again times where doors will open to you to where you will have an opportunity to take possession of a blessing that the Lord has for you. And every time that those doors open, you should go through those doors. Then again, at the same time, there are times where doors will open to you to be the blessing, as Paul spoke of in, in his letter to the Corinthians. OK, there are times where you are meant to walk through the door and to be the blessing to somebody somewhere. And as often as you have the opportunity to do it, as Paul said in his letter to the Galatians. You should not grow weary in doing good. You should take advantage of every opportunity. Every time that the Lord opens a door for you, you should walk through the doors. But sadly, again, many of us, we, we don't do that. We, there are a lot of times where the Lord, he opens a door for us and he tells us the blessing is on the other side of that door. All we have to do is walk through the door. But sometimes, hey, you know, we, we may get to that doorway and we may look around and it may look dangerous. We may look down and there may, you know, there may be some danger. The path may be narrow in front of us. And we say, Lord, I'm afraid to go across. I'm not going to go across. What are you thinking? I'm just going to stay right here where it's safe. And the only thing that we do when we don't walk through the door that the Lord has opened for us is we hinder ourselves. We block ourselves from the blessing that the Lord will have for us on the other side of the door. And then again, when the Lord opens the door for you to be the blessing for somebody somewhere, again, there are times where we'll open the door and we'll see who's on the other side of the door. And it may be Joe, who we don't like. It may be Amy, who, who we don't like. It could be John, who despises and hates us. And we'll say, Lord, are you, are you crazy? I'm not going through that door. I don't want anything to do with that person. It almost will sound like Ananias when it came to Paul. You know, Ananias, he, he almost told the Lord, no, I'm not going to do that. That's Paul over there. Paul, he, have you not heard about what Paul was doing to the church and how he persecuted the church, how he was trying to kill us, and now you want me to go and, and to minister to him? But Ananias, when he heard from the Lord, he, he actually moved. He went through the door. You and I, again, every opportunity that God gives to us to be the blessing we should be the blessing. We must again heed the spirit, be led by the spirit, walk by faith, be the blessing. And I tell you, when you walk by faith, there is always a great reward for you. That is, again, something that we must do. Walk by faith. Now, again, to go back over to the third chapter of the book of Revelation there. I've spoken about, I've spoken in great detail about what the door, the open door that was set before those who were in the church in Philadelphia, what, what it could be. But we had already touched on another possibility, right? 
to where the door could be the door to the kingdom of heaven that had been set before those who are of the church in Philadelphia. So there is, again, another door that I believe is represented here that, yes, is the door to the kingdom of heaven. But do you know who that door is? That door, as we have seen already there in the seventh verse and that we have spoken about in this study, that door is, or it could be, and I believe it is, Jesus Christ. Now, there is scripture that we can reference for this as well that we'll find over in the 10th chapter of John's gospel. Let us turn over there to the 10th chapter of John's gospel. And in the 10th chapter of John's gospel, we'll see where Jesus was speaking about how he was the good shepherd. In the 10th chapter of John's gospel, you'll see that that chapter opens up with Jesus saying, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. He then said there in the second verse, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus was saying that he was the good shepherd. And you'll see Jesus say exactly that uh, in the seventh verse, where he speaks of himself again as the the good shepherd. Look at what Jesus said there. Jesus said to them again, we're told, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And again there, let's take a look at the ninth verse where Jesus said, I am the door. He said, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And there again in the 11th verse, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus said that he is the shepherd. He said that he is the door to the sheepfold. The sheepfold at that point in time, there was just, again, yes, a wall, you know, a square wall, if you, if you will. But the door, the door to the fold was not like a door that could be open and shut. It was just, you know, an empty space that the shepherd could go into the fold with that the sheep could enter in and, and go out in. And so, at that point in time, what the shepherd would do would be to block the passage with their own body. And so they were essentially the door. And that's what Jesus, he describes himself as. Those who would come into the sheepfold would be his sheep. Jesus, he was saying that he was not going to allow a thief or robber nor any kind of predator to get past him. He is the door who opens and shuts. And, and again, nobody can open him up. Nobody can force him open and nobody can force him shut. So Jesus, he said there, I am the door. Jesus, I want you to understand that he again is the door. So there are three possibilities, right? That we've seen there for the door being set before those who are the church in Philadelphia and for all of us today as well, who are of sincere faith. The doors that are open to us can be doors, again, that lead to our faith maturing, that leads to our faith growing in knowledge and in understanding. Doors can open for us. The Lord can set doors before us that that open to us having an opportunity to take possession of a blessing or being a blessing for somebody somewhere. And then again, there is a door that Jesus said that he is the door. And that he will open up. And again, there in that ninth verse where Jesus said, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out. And then Jesus said that they will go in and out and find pastor. What do you suppose that pastor is? What is the pastor that Jesus will allow his sheep to go out into, to be able to graze and to be able to relax in? None other than the kingdom of heaven, right? Jesus, again, said he is the way, the truth and the life. Nobody can come to the father but by him. He told the disciples in the 14th chapter of John's gospel that he was going away to prepare a place for all of those who sincerely believe in him in his father's house. His father's house is the pasture that Jesus is the door to that he will allow you to come in to. And the only ones that, that can come into his pasture or coming to his sheepfold, I should say, are all of those who are of sincere faith. 
If you're not of sincere faith, you're either a thief, a robber, or a predator. And Jesus is not going to allow you to come in to his sheepfold. That is where those who sincerely follow him. Yes, we are sheep. People will look at that, that word and they'll think something bad about it. But we are his sheep. Yes, I'm happy to say that I'm a sheep of Christ. I'm happy to say that I follow him. Christ is not going to let any harm come upon his sheep. He is again the door. Again, that door that was set before those who are of the church in Philadelphia is a wonderful door. All right. A door of opportunities, a door where they could grow and mature in their faith, a door that is Christ that they can walk through that is open to them to where the kingdom of heaven is a reward for their faith. All right. Now, let's tackle our other scripture here. Let's let's take a look here at the ninth verse. Where there in the ninth verse, Jesus, he said, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Now, those who were of the synagogue of Satan that were saying that they were Jews or not, Jesus said to those who are the church in uh, Smyrna, he knew their blasphemy, which meant that they were supposed to be living obediently by faith, living according to God's instructions. But they were of the synagogue of Satan, which which means that they certainly weren't abiding by the word of God. And so because they were not abiding by the word of God, they ended up persecuting those who were in the church in Smyrna. They were afflicting those who were in the church in Smyrna. OK, they, they were a cause of, of grief and hurt tribulation for those who are in the church in Smyrna. Let us remember again that to the church in Smyrna, Jesus had encouraged them to endure, persevere, continue to be faithful. Now, those who are in the church of Philadelphia, they, I want you to understand, likely faced the same thing. There's a reason why we see Jesus make that reference there. Okay. There's a reason why we see Jesus mention the Jews who weren't Jews, but they lied again, blaspheme. They were blasphemers. Okay. They were of the synagogue of Satan. And the reason why Jesus makes a mention of that is because those who are in the church in Philadelphia, they likely underwent the same thing where they faced persecution. They, they faced those who, who despised them and would afflict them. They, they faced tribulation. But in facing their persecutors, those who caused great suffering for them, they overcame. Now, how did they overcome? How did they overcome those who were persecuting them? The only way that we can overcome those who persecute us, the only way that we can overcome tribulation is by faith. Again, living according to the word of God, being led by the Holy Spirit and walking in the spirit. When we walk in the spirit, as Paul said, we are able to produce the fruits that are holy and righteous. Those who are the church in Philadelphia, they were persevering. They were enduring. They were overcoming. Again, they were doing this not by their own strength, not by their own might. They were walking by faith. Incredibly important for us to understand because again, Yes, we face much tribulation in the world today by those who who don't like it that we walk by faith. They, they do their best to to hinder us in our walk. And again, how do we overcome? We overcome by faith, being obedient to the word of God. Now, look at the great reward there in the ninth verse for those who endure, those that that persevere, those that that overcome by living by the word of God. Jesus said that those who are of the synagogue of Satan, Jesus said that they would be worshipers. He said there, look at this. He said, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie indeed. I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I love you. There are many people that will scoff and mock 
the idea that you are loved by the Lord. You again are to persevere, continue to be faithful. Don't disregard what, what the adversary is trying to say to you, because the only thing that they're trying to do is to pull you away from, from the Lord. If you again endure, again persevere, Jesus said that they will one day recognize, they will hum, they will be humbled by this. They will recognize that the Lord, that he did and that he does love you. What Jesus speaks of there in that ninth verse, it is a reference to the millennial kingdom, where in the millennial kingdom, by that point in time, the church will be the bride of Christ. That is something that we have spoken about before uh, in Scripture. Again, you can see that in the book of Revelation. You can see the bride of Christ in the book of Revelation uh, in the 21st chapter. I'm not going to turn there. What I do want to turn to is the 20th chapter here in the book of Revelation so that we can get a picture for the millennial kingdom and something that will occur in the millennial kingdom that is, is being spoken of here uh, in our study this week. There in the 20th chapter and the fourth verse, you can see, you can get a picture of the millennial kingdom and we'll see there where scripture says there in the fourth verse, John said that he saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. He said there, then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The millennial kingdom, the millennial kingdom, it speaks of the time where, where it occurred after the rapture of the church. It will occur after the great tribulation the millennial kingdom, that's the second coming of Christ, where Christ will set up his throne in the world and he will reign for a thousand years. If you want to read more of the millennial kingdom, you can actually start uh, there in the first verse here in the 20th chapter and then work your way all the way down really to the 10th verse there. OK, um, the millennial kingdom. Again, it occurred after those two events where at the millennial kingdom, Christ will return. The bride will be with him. And as we see there in the fourth verse, there will be thrones. And those who will be on the throne, we are told there in the sixth verse. Okay. In the sixth verse, you'll see it says there in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So that verse, it tells us again, the fourth verse shows us that there are going to be thrones and those that sit on the thrones, that judgment will be committed to them. Who is it that's sitting on those thrones? The sixth verse tells us that it will be those who have part in the first resurrection. So who is it that will have part in the first resurrection? Well, let me tell you, those Old Testament believers, when, 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 when Christ raptures, when he comes and he raptures out his church, those who are dead in Christ, they, they will rise first. The, the, the Old Testament believers, they're, they're going to be there. The church, that's all of us who will raise, you know, we'll raise up from the dead. Those who are living they will join, okay? And again, I want to remind you that the living at that point in time when Jesus raptures out his church, flesh and blood can't enter into the kingdom of heaven. They're going to put off this body, this physical body, and they'll put on their, their holy body. They'll be transformed in the twinkling of an eye is what Paul said in scripture. So who, again, will be a part of that first resurrection? Again, the, the Old Testament believers, the, those who are of the church age, that's us all of us sincere believers. And then again, as we saw there in the fourth verse, you'll see that those who were beheaded for their witness to Jesus, those who had not worshiped the beast, this gets us into the tribulation saints territory. I want you to understand today, the great tribulation, no matter what anybody says, the great tribulation has not occurred. It has not occurred because the rapture of the church 
has not occurred. The church is still present in the world today. So those who don't have, again, the mark on their forehead of, of the beast, those tribulation saints, they're going to be in the millennial kingdom as well as, as we have studied about before in the past. And, and they are going to reign as well. And those who are of the synagogue of Satan, they will see all of this and they're going to be humbled. They're going to be humbled because they won't have any part in this. The millennial kingdom, that is for all of the faithful believers, all of those that have been saved, those who are saved of every age, Old Testament age, church age, the age of the tribulation, which actually won't be all that long. The great tribulation is not going to be all that long. But again, all of the saved of every age will reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's just in the world. That doesn't talk about eternal life. Okay. That eternal life that comes after the, the millennial kingdom that, that comes after the, the so-called Armageddon battle, which actually won't be a battle as well. So going back over here to the third chapter of the book of Revelation, again, there we, we saw the great reward that we will have over those who are of the synagogue of Satan. There in the 10th verse, we'll see more reward here because again, living by faith. And yes, Jesus is saying this to those who are the church in Philadelphia, but as I have said, this message is for all of the churches as well, all of those who are of sincere faith. We're told there in the 10th verse, Jesus said, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So what is that? What is that hour of trial that, that we'll see Jesus said that he will keep the believer, that he will keep the believer from. What is that in reference to? Now, I spoke about the millennial kingdom. I actually mentioned the great tribulation, the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth speaks of the great tribulation. Like I said, the great tribulation, it doesn't last that long. We'll see Jesus said that it is the hour an hour of trial, according to, to how he, he measures time. He doesn't measure time like how we do. But the great tribulation, as scripture shows us, doesn't last all that long. But there is going to be great tribulation. And those who, who go through that period of time will be those who did not believe in Christ during the age of the church. The great tribulation, it follows the rapture of the church. All those who are of sincere faith will not go under. They will not face the great tribulation. We're going to be called out of the world. And when we are called out of the world, when the church, those, all of those who are of sincere faith are called out of the world, it is going to give way to a period of great suffering in the world. And during that time period, scripture speaks about how the man of sin will be revealed over in first Thessalonians. Let's, let's turn over there real quick. I like to try to show you all as much scripture as I possibly can, because I don't want anybody to think that, that I'm making anything up. We, we're dealing with sound doctrine. So let's turn over to first Thessalonians. And when you get over to first Thessalonians, I want you to stop at the fourth chapter of first Thessalonians and there in the fourth chapter, we're going to take a look at uh, the 15th through the 17th verse where we'll see there in the 15th through the 17th verse where scripture speaks of how the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And we're told that the dead in Christ will rise first and then you'll see there in the 17th verse that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That speaks of the rapture, which I just mentioned to you. Now, over in 2 Thessalonians, 
the second chapter in second Thessalonians and in the third verse, you'll see there where Paul said, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Speaking of the, the great apostasy said the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This, this person, this man of sin, the son of perdition that is revealed is the antichrist who will deceive the world during the days of the great tribulation. So there's going to be the rapture. There's going to be the great tribulation where there's going to be great suffering. There's going to be a great deception that is led by the Antichrist who will fool, who will trick, who will deceive many into believing that, that he is God and many will actually worship him. All right. But again, I want to remind you that, that you who are of faith, all of us who are of faith, we're not going to ever see the person that is the Antichrist. Now, yes, there are many living in the world today who has the spirit of Antichrist as, as John spoke of in his first epistle. But again, you and I, through our sincere faith in the Lord, we have power. We have power over them. Don't be, don't be afraid of them. Don't, don't be deceived by them as well. You have authority. You have power over them through your faith in the Lord. You will overcome all of your adversaries, all of your obstacles as well. Now, again, I want to show you one more verse here uh, in the 24th chapter of Matthew's gospel where Jesus, he speaks of, again, how great the tribulation will be. There's a warning there in the 24th chapter of Matthew's gospel. When you get to the 24th chapter of Matthew, go down to the 19th verse and there in the 19th verse, you will see where Jesus said, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Jesus, he said there in the 20th verse, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. He said there in the 21st verse, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been seen, has been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. Jesus was talking about the day of the great tribulation, the hour of trial, or where, where again, those who dwell on the earth will be tested. It will be their last opportunity to turn to have faith in the Lord. That great tribulation is going to be so great that Jesus even warns about it, saying, whoa, you know, I hope nobody is, is pregnant in that day. And I kind of, you know, almost chuckle at that, but it's not a laughing matter. Faith, believing in the Lord, it is serious. All of us, we, we have a pivotal choice that, that we have to make. Are we going to live in obedience? Are, are we going to live by the word of God or are we going to disregard the word of God? This is a very important choice that, that all of us have to make today. I hope that you will choose to live in obedience to the word of God, because again, as we have seen here, there's a great reward. We won't take part in the great tribulation. We're going to have part in the millennial kingdom. And then after the millennial kingdom, we go on to reign with the Lord for all of eternity, for everlasting life. And we'll see Jesus. He speaks to this in the 11th verse where, where Jesus again, he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Said there in the 12th verse, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. The temple of God is not in this world. The temple of God is, is in the kingdom of heaven. So that temple being a pillar in the temple of God you have everlasting life. There's nothing temporary about heaven. Said he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. He said there, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, 
the new Jerusalem, which John spoke of seeing coming down in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. He said there, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And then he said, and I will write on him my new name, the name of salvation, deliverance, overcoming the world. And being with him because you believed and, and you had faith, you have faith in him today. Hold fast, Jesus said. Continue to walk in faith. Continue to again, when the Lord opens doors for you, continue to go through those doors. What is faith? Yes, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, trusting it, leaning on, depending on the Lord, living according to his will. That is what faith is all about. Putting God first in your life. Are you able to do that? Many of us, we, we struggle with doing that. But again, we must learn. We must keep on growing. We must keep on maturing in our faith. When, again, we do that, when we grow, when we mature in our faith, we are able to overcome all of the obstacles that, that life throws our way. We are able to do that not by our strength, not by our might, we are able to do that because we are led by the Holy Spirit. And because we are led by the Holy Spirit, we bear fruit that is holy and righteous. And that is very important when it comes to our faith. Our faith, it is supposed to be fruitful. As Jesus speaks about in the 15th chapter of John's gospel, we are to bear fruit. The reason why we are to bear fruit is because we are connected to the true vine, which is Jesus Christ. And so the last verse there, we'll see there in the 13th verse where Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Do you have an ear today? And are you being attentive to the word of God? If you are being attentive to the word of God, then you should be living by the word of God. When you live by the word of God, when you are obedient to the word of God, you are living by faith in your faith, it will be rewarded. All right. So that is our study for this week. I hope that you enjoyed this study. And we have one more church to go in this study season where we're going to be taking a look at the lukewarm church. And then after we take a look at the, luke, the lukewarm church, we'll move on further into our season of studies where, again, we're going to get into some good stuff where we're going to be talking about forgiveness along with with many other harsh truths that, that you and I, we need to look at today. So again, I hope that you'll come back for our study next week. Thanks again for watching this study. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment, follow today.